remember we're talking about the context of your passage with regard to the extra biblical context now. Uh, paper number six is biblical context. Paper number seven will be the extra biblical context. And when we came to this section and this slide uh, last week, remember we had talked about how that culture, history, geography, politics, economy, and religion all form a backdrop for your text. Whether you're in Isaiah, whether you're in Psalms, whether you're in Job, there is a background. There is a setting. There is a date. There's an author for your book. And these issues matter as you look at them to try to figure out how they contribute to the interpretation of the text. And especially as you're preparing to preach a message and as you're preparing to do an exposition of your text, uh, this semester is your last assignment. Uh, you want to try to provide some of that background for your people so they have a better understanding of uh, the text and where it comes from and why it's significant within its own time, within its own space, and with its own immediate uh, occupants, the people around it as that event takes place. We'd mentioned last time the black obelisk of Shalmaneser III. Uh, that obelisk stands about seven feet high. It's made of black basalt, and uh, this particular panel on the ob obelisk is a picture of what is presumed to be King Jehu, who is bowing down before Shalmaneser III uh, and paying tribute. And the inscription says that this bowl that Shalmaneser is holding in his hands right there is a gold shoplu vessel. Shoplu is a technical term for a type of vessel that is used uh, in the Akkadian language and was used by the Babylonians and the Assyrians. So as you look at that, that's just one specific tie to the biblical text because we know about Jehu, we know about his reign, we know about his yielding to the Assyrians and paying tribute. And so it gives us one piece of extra biblical evidence that relates to it. The date for this obelisk is usually put somewhere between 842 and 840 BC, somewhere in that period of time for this particular inscription to have been written. Now as we move on, I want to take you again, I've, I've used the book of Proverbs because Proverbs tends to get ignored. Uh, seldom do men preach from the book of Proverbs. Seldom do men get involved in writing commentaries in the book of Proverbs. And sometimes we just kind of ignore it. We read it a little bit here and there. We may use it to teach our children. We may memor memorize a few. But when it comes to exegeting and expounding the book of Proverbs, we run into a number of issues. We talked last week about clusters and strings of Proverbs on the internal biblical context. Let's talk a little bit about the external context for the book of Proverbs. We know that Solomon composed many Proverbs. We know they collected Proverbs from all over the world. Remember, he sent ships out as far away as India and uh, sent them off to parts of Africa and throughout the Mediterranean. And they brought goods back and they brought Proverbs br back. They brought histories back. They brought all kinds of things back into the land of Israel. And there was an Egyptian influence on the book of Proverbs that seems quite obvious. <laughs> Uh, when we look at the teaching of Amenemapi, uh, who lived prior to the time of Solomon, we find a number of Proverbs th that he wrote that match those that, pro that uh, Solomon had. Remember Solomon's in the 10th century BC. And Amenemapi, Amenemapi is the 12th century BC. So they're about 200 years apart from each other. And so it's very possible that when uh, Solomon had contact with Egypt, remember he ma married an Egyptian princess and he had contact with Egyptian pharaohs. He collected some Egyptian proverbs. And he may have collected some of those that were Amenemapis or he may have taken them and rewritten them. And this becomes especially acute and true in chapters 22, 17 through 23, 14 with the exception of five verses which are not found with any parallels in the writings of Amenemapi. Uh, there's also 
particular Proverbs found outside the section that seem to apply to Amenemapi in chapters 12, 15, 16, 20, 24, 25, 26, and 27. So what do we say about these? Derek Kidner has written uh, a few introductions to wisdom literature. And he's written a commentary on Proverbs in the Tyndale Old Testament commentary series. He says this about the use of Proverbs in, uh, from Egypt and being placed into the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament. If Proverbs is the borrower here, in other words, if the book of Proverbs, as we have it in the Old Testament, is the borrower from Egypt, the borrowing is not slavish, but free and creative. Egyptian jewels, as at the Exodus, have been reset to their advantage by Israelite workmen and put to finer use. I like his analogy. It's the analogy of the tabernacle. When the Israelites left Egypt, remember that they asked the Egyptians for goods and they, the Egyptians gave them gold and jewelry and precious stones and all kinds of things and they used those to build the tabernacle. And so there's a, this analogies in here of a precedent of Israelites using things that are Egyptian and he said why not use wisdom. If you go through the scriptures and you look at what wisdom is you find out that this, the Bible talks about the wisdom of Egypt in several locations, the wisdom of Edom, the wisdom of Babylon, the wisdom of Persia, the wisdom of so many different places. You can go through and read about so that there's recognized that there is wisdom even in the uh, non-biblical sphere of reference, uh, referring to secular wisdom. In other words, there's some truth that can be gained from secular wisdom. And uh, why not? Uh, God is the creator of man and uh, man has a brain that has been given to him to think with and God has also uh, put within the heart of man even his law according to Romans chapter 2 and so there ought to be some wisdom out there that is usable even from unbelievers and that's what we find in the Old Testament referred to again and again. They are capable of knowing truth and then you have these particular Proverbs, a couple of the examples. For example, in chapter 10, verse 2 of the book of Proverbs, ill-gotten treasures are of no value. In chapter 23, 5, cast but a glance at riches and they are gone, for they will surely sprout wings and fly off the sky like an eagle. And then look at the words of Amenemapi. If riches are brought to you by robbery, those are ill-gotten riches. They will not spend the night with you. They're of no value. They're not spending the night with you. In fact, they have made themselves wings like geese and are flown away to the heavens. Instead of eagles, geese used in the Egyptian picture. But notice the same idea. We talk about how time flies. Well, money flies too. It takes wings and goes right out of our wallets, especially with the price of gasoline right now, right? <laughs> You're all paying it and trying to commute into seminary and uh, get to work and everything. That imagery is a common imagery throughout the ancient Near East. It doesn't have to be really borrowed even from Egypt to be used in Israel because it's a common way of thinking. And you and I, we, we can hardly even know where we got the imagery we use. If we talk about time flying or money flying out of our wallets, either one, uh, where did we get that imagery? Some of our imagery comes right out of the Bible because of our culture and uh, the cultures we come from in Europe also use much of that because of the Bible. So it all may come from there, it may come from other examples, but uh, this is not an unusual set of uh, circumstances where you'd have a proverb in the book of Proverbs matching a proverb in Egypt. Take another one. He who guards his lips guards his life, but he who speaks rashly will come to ruin in Proverbs 13 verse 3. There's another Egyptian writer by the name of Ani. He wrote this, you should not express your whole heart to the stranger to let him discover your speech against you. A man may fall to ruin because of his tongue. Um, ever since even uh, World War II when the motto in America was loose lips sink ships. 
And even today, our son in uh, Afghanistan, he tells us, if I tell you something, if I tell you that I'm going to be doing something, please don't put it on Facebook or the Internet or send it around in a mass email because it'll get back here. And he said, uh, that's one of the ways the uh, Taliban uh, find out what troop movements are going on and where the American troops are. All they have to do is watch Facebook and watch other things and someone lets something slip and says, uh, we're praying for you because we know today you're going to such and such and doing such and such. Or writes back and say, where is that? I've never heard of it before. You know, and so that hint gets out there. It's one of those things that's not just weak WikiLeaks that have leaks or gains material. I mean, I tell my wife all the time, I tell her, you know, uh, let's use some wisdom. Let's use some proverbial wisdom. All right? If we're traveling, don't post it on Facebook. <laughs> All right? Anyone who manages to get on Facebook or check or read any post there, they'll know we're gone and they can come and get into the house, rob us blind. And uh, some of us are very foolish. We, we Twitter and tweet and do everything and tell everyone everything we're doing. And they know exactly when we're not going to be home, how far away we are, and when we're going to get home and what we're doing. And uh, then we wonder how come we find stuff missing when we get home or the house is broken into or someone sucked the gasoline out of our gas tank, you know, <laughs> besides the price being high, you know. So this is, isn't this common human condition? It's the same thing. Whether it's Egyptian or whether it's Israelite, it is commonly known truths. And that's what Proverbs is made up a lot of. Common truths, common axioms. Yes, Bellum. Now, would you say uh, Solomon could do that because he was a wise man and, and he was inspired by God to, to grab truth, kind of plunder the Egyptians and incorporate that into biblical truth? Whereas today people are trying to make that jump and say psychology, all truth is God's truth, incorporate that. Well, I'm saying that it's possible, like Kidner said, that it's borrowed and then redressed in Israelite garb, uh, put it in its own setting and used the way Solomon wanted to use it. Or it's just common truth that everyone had and didn't need to be borrowed. It was just a common body of knowledge and way of talking and speaking that everyone knew in the ancient Near East. And so it's not a surprise that we find it commonly, not just in the Egyptians and in Israelite literature, but we find it in Sumerian literature and Babylonian and Assyrian literature as well. Okay? Now, let's talk about what you do as far as resources for finding the ancient Near Eastern setting. Bible atlases. I brought some with me. Uh, one of them that I really love is the Holy Land Satellite Atlas. This was printed in Cyprus. Uh, it is put out by Roar Productions. And uh, huge photos, satellite photos in full color. And the maps are marked that way and photographs all the way through, sometimes two pages wide. Beautifully done. When you go through something of this nature, you almost feel like you're there. I mean, here you are at Qumran. And uh, fantastic pictures and photos of the land and uh, the maps are marked and labeled right on it's a satellite map rather than being a drawn map uh, using pen and ink to draw it or to reproduce it it's just a photograph and then overlaid are the places and numbers to identify them with the key down here along the side and those types of maps are really helpful in fact, there's some flyover maps like that available online where you can computerize and zoom in on a location uh, that's uh, a lot like what you get when you use Google Earth. And use Google Earth to do the same thing. I, I use Google Earth to fly through the Grand Canyon and uh, look at rapids and look at different things and prepare myself for trips every summer. And this type of thing is exactly what you can do as well. This really is a marvelous tool and a guide to help understand the lay of the land in Israel. I, I love just even the cover of it that shows the mountains and uh, shows the snow on them. And uh, there's Mount Hermon there and here's the Sea of Galilee down here. Just, just fantastic material. This type of atlas obviously has a little bit less of wording in it to read. It's more pictures, but a picture is worth a thousand words, right? 
And uh, as you look at this, it gives you an excellent concept of your location and what you're seeing and where you're at. There are two volumes to this set and it is well worth having. Uh, in fact, I believe that in the second volume, this is the first one, the second volume, I think they have some maps that are folded in the back that you can take out and fold out to take a look at. Superb example of something different in the way of atlases that is very helpful in understanding them. It's called the Holy Land Satellite Atlas. The Holy Land Satellite Atlas. It's really well done. Uh, Richard Cleave is the photographer. C-L-E-A-V-E. -E, Richard Cleave. C-L-E-A-V-E. -E, published by Rohr Publications. R-O-H-R. -R. Rohr Productions is what they call it. And this was published in 1994. Another of my favorite atlases, and there's a lot of good atlases. I only brought in two. I have six or seven atlases. I have Barry Beitzel's atlas. I have uh, the uh, New Crossway atlas. I got it last uh, year. Uh, I have a lot of atlases because I just love collecting them, and the idea of looking at them, seeing the maps, the different amounts of information in them are well worth your time. Uh, I think every pastor ought to have two or three good Bible atlases on his shelf. A good one to have is the Macmillan Bible Atlas that is now called CARTA, C-A-R-T-A, CARTA Bible Atlas. Uh, let me see if I can fire up the Elmo here and show you a little bit of what I mean about the value of this atlas. You can see that, that each map is labeled, carefully marked, and there's text to go along with it. This map on the lower left is about a campaign of Thutmose the Third back in 1468 BC when the Canaanites rebelled and overthrew the Egyptian uh, uh, military at Megiddo. And Thutmose the Third marched his troops for 21 days up through Gaza and up on up to Megiddo to uh, recapture it and take it back from the Canaanites. And you have a full text describing it, but you also have a map here that shows the route up through Yacham, the three choices of routes to Megiddo, and a description that he took the middle route, shows you where the Canaanite um, uh, uh, infantry and uh, the uh, uh, chariots were gathered and placed to try to defend the other approaches to Megiddo. And you have... Uh, the maps also show a good deal of uh, relief for the terrain and show you the movements of troops, the movements of people, the migrations of tribes. Uh, it's just very well done. Here's one of David's wanderings that show where he went in the wilderness. This is panel after panel, map after map, two, three maps per page through the entire atlas. It's, it's just magnificent. It's one of the best atlases. Now, it doesn't have all the wonderful color. doesn't have a lot of pictures in it. In fact, most of the pictures are just black and white, or they have drawings, like here, of a water flask. Uh, and you have, back a little bit further, here you have the Dead Sea uh, sect and their treasures being up here, get this down there, there where, where you can see there. And then you have a map that's showing the different produce in the various regions of uh, Israel. And I'm going to show you a couple others in here that uh, you have an example like this that is of the uh, city of Jerusalem. Gives you a full map, a layout. And here's one of them I like. Here you see the Sea of Galilee. You've got kind of a cutaway uh, cross section here so you can picture how high it is here at Gadara and how it goes down and you come back up on the other side and uh, it shows the movement back and forth across the sea. Uh, the drowning of the Gadarene swine here uh, in the uh, uh, area of uh, Gadara. And then up here in the, you have uh, Capernaum and Chorazin and Gennesaret 
And here you have Magdala. And it's all labeled. And notice that you have the scripture passages placed in as well. So you have a full key. And then the back you have indexes that cover the uh, place names. Uh, unfortunately no Bible index. That would be nice to have. Oh there we go. Here's a, a brief one. It's not a very good one. It's one page and it doesn't really hold everything that could be given all the way through. But this is a superb atlas, one that I'm always turning to and looking at to see what the movements are that I'm reading about in Scripture, to get an idea of what the terrain was like, where the people are going, where they're traveling. So that is an example of an atlas that is not as beautiful as this satellite atlas with all its beautiful full color photography, but has an abundance of information. This is information heavy here. Yes, Alda? This is Macmillan, M-A-C-M-I-L-L-A-N, Macmillan Bible Atlas. It is now reprinted and done under the name Carta Bible Atlas, Carta, C-A-R-T-A. It's a superb Bible atlas. And then uh, before I turn off the Elmo, I wanted to put this up here so you'd uh, get an idea. This is a book called Life in Biblical Israel by Philip King and Lawrence Steger. And I believe all of these I have given you in uh, on pages 85 and 86 of your study notes. I've given you a list of all the materials, the sources for ancient Near Eastern backgrounds. It includes the Carta Bible Atlas. It includes Beitzel's Atlas. It includes uh, the Crossway Atlas. It includes the Holy Land Satellite Atlas uh, by Cleve. Uh, it includes this volume as well by King and Steger. It's listed on page uh, 87 in those study notes. But this volume is the best volume available on cultural life in ancient Israel. There's no other that matches it. It is just an amazing work. Uh, it, it unfortunately is on slick paper and not very well bound, so mine's already falling apart. But you've got full color pictures all the way through and uh, very good description broken down into different areas of sociology and culture, uh, looking at warfare, looking at trade, looking at transport, overland routes, metallurgy, textiles, animal husbandry, cultivation, the agricultural years, medical uh, and, and threats to health, uh, dealing with parasites, for example. It's uh, really a magnificent volume. I recommend that every one of you have it. I think that every seminarian ought to have it and uh, every pastor ought to have a copy. Uh, it's hard to find good Bible background materials. There are a number of works out there now that are helping us out historically and archaeologically. Uh, there's the Zondervan Pictorial uh, Bible uh, Encyclopedia that is available. Uh, there's a um, new work by John, edited by John Walton. I think I've got it listed here. Uh, the Il Zondervan Illustrated Bible Backgrounds Commentary, five volumes. Uh, one of our uh, former grads here, uh, Fred Maybe, uh, did one of the books in there, I think First Chronicles, and also did some of the photography for that. It's a lot of good information there. But as far as the culture itself, this is the only book that really covers it in great detail. I don't know if you've preached from Psalm 23 or heard men preach from Psalm 23 that talk about anointing the head with oil. And uh, some uh, preachers have actually decided that what that is is a, a figure of speech uh, for putting oil around the uh, holes for serpents. Uh, when you're sh shepherding your sheep and it keeps poisonous serpents away from the sheep, that's uh, worse than an urban myth. It's a myth entirely. Uh, the reason head, the head was anointed in ancient times was to take care of lice. Because if you anoint the head and you get it all over in your hair, that oil clogs the pores on lice and kills them, suffocates them. And that's one of the things that's talked about here. It says, another means of eliminating lice was smearing the hair with oil. This treatment prevented oxygen 
from penetrating the head and cause the lice to suffocate. That's right here within the text. Talks about a number of other things as well. That is invaluable to have that kind of background information to understand certain practices within ancient Israel. Um, gentlemen, I, I can't imagine wanting to study the Bible and not wanting to know more about the culture. It just is one of those ways it just opens doors and windows for us to better understand it. Andrew? Um, one concern I have is, you know, often whenever you read different common rates, they all take like, different cultural thing, practices and say completely different things about it. So as a person who's not trained, how do you make sure that what you're finding out or discovering about culture is actually true and not something right. that is changed? In other words, don't depend on commentators depend on those who are experts in that area, like King and Steger. These are archaeologists. These are students, uh, professors, long-standing, done a lot of work in Israel. Uh, Lawrence Steger is the lead excavator at Ashkelon. Uh, Philip King has written a number of volumes on archaeology as it relates to the scriptures. Uh, these two men are well recognized for their ability to really cut through all of the myths and legends and the guesses and get down to the concrete facts of, of uh, what cultural practices were followed at that time and how different cultural artifacts were used. Uh, many commentators rely upon the stories from older commentaries of uh, people who have just traveled to Israel for just a visit and come back home, been a pilgrim there, and they bring back some amazing stories about different things, and you end up with things that just utter nonsense. So yes, don't trust the commentary, trust someone like this, and use this type of volume to cut through and find out what the real things are. Uh, get involved in the books that deal with the culture and with uh, um, archeology span and history instead of looking merely at commentators. All right, yes? As far as finding resources like that for a particular text, it's almost kind of like working backwards because you know, the, the book isn't necessarily categorized by verses. So I'm wondering, I mean, apart from looking at a scripture index in the back, which is obviously really helpful, a lot of the times that's not always going to lead you to the information that you need. Right, so you want to watch for the cultural clues within your text. For example, anointing the head with oil. So find out, look under the topics of anointing, head, and oil. Uh, if you are in a text in, in the Psalms and it talks about God being a shield, my son and my shield. What's the Hebrew word for shield? What kind of shield is it? Go to a lexicon to find out. Then go to get a picture of that to some of the works that are done by Othmar Kiel on symbolism and iconography in the Psalms where he takes uh, pictures of uh, ancient Near Eastern monuments that have drawings on them and matches those up with what the text is talking about. So you can find out from the Hebrew whether or not it's a large standing shield that someone would stand behind and maybe shoot arrows from behind or whether it's a small round shield carried on the arm by someone who's in the midst of battle swinging a sword and is at the front line of battle. Uh, that's uh, two totally different kinds of shields and it helps to give you that uh, background. And then in a book like this you look in under the area of armaments and military and uh, weaponry and it gives you fuller description and other pictures of them as well. Then there's men who have written widely on, for example, Yigal Yadin wrote a lot on biblical warfare, warfare and uh, ha, uh, compiled a huge catalog of all the weaponry that's been found in archaeological digs in the ancient Near East and categorizes them by means of the different peoples and what they used. The Egyptians used one kind of bow. The Assyrians or Babylonians may have used a different kind of bow. And so that helps you to then pick out all those things and, and uh, get them uh, correctly identified. But you just have to take the object itself and then look it up. Another short trip to that, a shortcut for that, is if you have something like a bow or arrows or shield or oil or a flask or something mentioned in the scripture, go to the Anchor Bible Dictionary, six volumes edited by David Noel Friedman, and look up that word for that object. 
and it will not only give you a description of it, but also refer you to the major works that are specifically about that, the experts in that area to talk about. And that, that gives you a, a huge amount of information that way. Anchor Bible Dictionary. It's, the, it's also called the Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary. Uh, word pictures in the Psalms? Othmar Keel. And if you go to uh, the section in your syllabus on Psalms for resources, I don't see it offhand, but it's Othmar Keel, O T H M A R. His last name is K E E L. And it's, uh, I think it's called uh, Symbols in the Psalms or something of that nature. Symbolism of the Biblical Psalms, yes. That's it. That's it. I'm certain it's in here somewhere, but I don't see it right offhand. On page six, there's, um, there's a, a, an image on any background as a reference to the symbolism of the biblical world. Is that the one? Sorry. Page six? Yeah, page six of the study notes. I see it. I've got it on page 24 in the bibliography of the uh, course syllabus. Uh, on page 24, the last entry on the bottom of the page, the symbolism of the biblical world, ancient Near Eastern iconography in the book of Psalms. Okay, I knew it was in here somewhere. And I, I don't see page 6 on here. Oh, there it is. I see. Yeah, there's a picture. Uh, on mine, it's page 43. <laughs> Uh, there's a picture in here. That's the type of drawing that Keel gives you. Here's the <coughs> reference here, Othmar Keel. And this is figure 115. And uh, this is part of your study notes and it, talking about ancient Near Eastern background. And it's showing there what a trap is for trapping birds. So you get to see exactly what that looks like. Not just read about it in the Psalms or elsewhere in Scripture. You get to see how the Egyptians would trap birds in the marshes using nets and gather them together. So that's a resource that is extremely valuable in uh, going through Scripture and uh, checking on such things. Then let's go to other resources. Bible geographies. I brought one in and read it to you uh, last week. Uh, by George Adam Smith, The Historical Geography of the Holy Land. Uh, superb volume. Very old, yes, but uh, that's an advantage in a way because he didn't have photog uh, a pho photography, so he doesn't have photographs to depend on, so he describes it by words, and when you're preaching, you've got to describe things with words. So read people who are used to describing things in words, learn how to use words to make people visualize it in their own minds. And uh, it, it goes a long ways to help. But there are a number of them. I've given them to you here in the uh, resources on uh, pages uh, 85 to uh, 89. There are about four pages of resources there. And I've given you another geography is by Johanan Aharoni. It's there on the bottom, page 85. Uh, the Land of the Bible, Historical Survey. Uh, superb volume. And another one by Dennis Bailey, B-A-L-Y. The Geography of the Bible, A Study in Historical Geography. You won't find anything written that's better than what Bailey has done. You can go through, he lets you know about the seasons, about precipitation, about the geology, uh, everything you can think of. And he ties it, here's the nice thing about Dennis Bailey. He ties it all to the biblical text, giving examples from the scripture to show us how the geography impacted certain events and people in the biblical text. Old Testament histories. Uh, get hold of G Eugene Merrill's book, uh, Kingdom of Priests. Uh, get hold of Walt Kaiser's book on, uh, old on the history of the Old Testament. His uh, book is entitled A History of Israel from the Bronze Age to the Jewish Wars. I've given it to you there on page 87 of the uh, list of books there for ancient and eastern background. There's all kinds of histories you can read. Histories of the Persians, histories of the Babylonians, histories of the Assyrians. Uh, there's even histories of the Edomites. Uh, get hold of the works of Nelson Glick 
who did a lot of work in archaeology in Edom, in ancient Edom. Uh, he gives a full description of uh, the people, their culture, their backgrounds in ways that will enlighten you, help you to understand why Israel and Edom as descendants of the twin brothers Jacob and Esau were always at each other throughout history. Uh, cultural studies like that by King and Steger is uh, one of the best ways to take a look at things. Uh, it's just, just so well done. Now let me go to the handout I gave you. I think the best way to try to understand how this applies and how it works out is if we look at an example. Perhaps from uh, a child you heard in Sunday school the story about Samson carrying off the gates of Gaza. And if you were like I was, <laughs> I always dreamed about it just being a very strong man carrying off a very flimsy gate. I lived in Casper, Wyoming. There was an old frontier fort outside of town along the Platte River called Fort Casper. And when we visited that, the gate was just made of a few pieces of wood. And you look at it and said, oh, well, yeah, I can't lift that. But a, a good, strong, heavyweight lifter could with no problem at all. Flimsy. I mean, you run a horse into it, it's going to fall down. So, you know, you look at it and say, it's no wonder this fort what didn't uh, last very long because it just wasn't very well built. It wasn't a stronghold. It wasn't fortified. It was just a location where people lived inside of kind of a flimsy wooden uh, fence, kind of haphazardly put together. And you look at that and you say, well, that must have been like Gaza was. After all, it was ancient times, right? Even older than the Old West. How wrong we can be. When Lawrence Steger did his work at Ashkelon, he uncovered the middle bronze gates of that city. The gates of that city were high. They were wide. You could drive two chariots through the city gate at Ashkelon at the same time. The, uh, the doors on the city gates were large and they were thick. And excavations done at Megiddo and at Hatsor and other locations in Israel demonstrate what those gates are like. If you go to the British Museum, you get to see the gates of Balat that have been reconstructed with new wood in them, uh, inside the metal sheathing of the doors of the gates that were done for decoration and for protection to keep people from burning the gates down or keep them from battering them down with a battering ram, you would put a sheath of metal over the top of the gate. And then the bar of the gate was not always just made of wood. If it was made of wood, it was very thick piece of wood, a heavy piece of wood. Sometimes take two or three men to put it in place to seal the gates at night. But they also used bronze and they used iron for the bars to block the gates. So as you're looking at the gates and you're figuring out what they are uh, and you find here that Samson picked them up sockets and bar and all and carried them off. Then it's no real light thing that was done. So back in 1975-76 when I was teaching in Denver I got together with a man who had worked for NASA as a scientist and we began to work on uh, the archaeological evidences of the gates of the time that would match the period of time of uh, the judges and of Samson. And I took the archaeological evidence and then converted that into data. You'll see the data on page 87 of this handout. You'll see here that uh, the gate was approximately three and a third feet thick. One meter thick, the door of the gates. It was three meters high. That would be 9.9 .9 feet. That gives you 32.67 square feet. Multiply it by the 9.9 .9 feet across the width of the gate because there were two leaves of that. And you end up with 323 cubic feet of wood just to do the two doors. Then you multiply that times 62.4 pounds, which is the number of pounds per cubic foot of water. 
Why do you do that? Because you want to find out specific gravity. I learned all about that uh, as a result of doing this. This uh, physics major then uh, explained to me that if you want to find out how much uh, 323 cubic feet of cedar wood weighs, you get a table that tells you the specific gravity of cedar wood and you find out it's 0.53, which means it floats because it's about half the density of water. So it'll float on top of water. And you multiply that times the pounds in a cubic foot of water and you get 20,000 pounds. You multiply that times the specific gravity, 0.53, and you end up with the wood alone for this gate is 10,696 plus pounds. And that's not counting the sheathing. That's not, not counting the bar. It's not counting the sockets. Now that's just the beginning. Because when we get this data and begin to understand it, we find out that Samson obviously performed a miracle. It was obviously the power of God, not Samson's natural strength that performed what was done. How many of you can walk out in this parking lot and pick up 10,000, let's say 11,000, rounded upwards a little bit, 11,000 pounds of automobile out there and carry it off any distance? You have a Chevy Tahoe, 6,600 pounds? You're still not there, are you? You've got to take another car and put it on top of it. You see? But then you find out that according to the text, he carried it off from the city to the top of a hill opposite Hebron. Now there are two interpretations. One interpretation says he took it to the top of a hill outside Gaza that was in the direction of Hebron. Well, even if that is 300 yards outside the city and then climbing the hill, do you want to do that too? I mean, and in reality, if you look at this, go back here to the back of the, of the uh, handout. If he took it to Hebron as the crow flies, that is about 32 miles as the crow flies. And do you think that you would carry those gates as the crow flies? I mean, anytime you had a little hump in the ground, I think you'd want to go around it rather than climbing it all the time. And then take a look at the back here and look at the change in elevation. You begin at Gaza, 100 feet above sea level, and if you go up to Hebron, it's 3,300 feet above sea level, so you have an elevation change of 3,200 feet. You know what that's like, gentlemen? That's like going out here in the parking lot, picking up 11, 12,000 pounds of automobiles, putting it on your backs, and starting out this direction and heading up Little Tahunga, climbing up over to the top up there at Bear Pass, up above where you have uh, uh, Dr. Uh, MacArthur's home on the other side down in the valley. You carry it all the way up to there. That would be about the equivalent. In fact, it isn't even 30 miles up there. It's a shorter distance. But try that sometime, if you will. You know, make a wager with someone. Say, if you'll do this, I'll buy you lunch or whatever. <laughs> but uh, no one's going to do it, are they? Because that is an impossible feat for a human being to perform. It is obvious that it was a miracle. And you see, too often as we're reading through scriptures, we tend to dumb things down, play it down, and make it something that it is not to avoid the miraculous and the supernatural. It is obvious that it was the Spirit of God empowering Samson. Whether he took it 100 yards or whether he took it 30 miles, it doesn't make any difference. It's still supernatural feat. And I believe the text says fairly clearly that it's the 30 miles that he took it. That is not a humanly capable feat to perform. That is a divine feat. That was something that the Spirit of God did through Samson and it matches some of the other episodes and es escapades we read about him in being empowered by the Spirit of God to do the things he did. I find over and over again as we go through scripture that we 
enter into those kind of realms where we have adequate scientific objective data available to get a clear picture of exactly what happened and in the end have to admit that it's supernatural and it's a miracle. It wasn't something natural. He just didn't walk up to the stockade uh, and take a flimsy wooden gate down and carry it off. This was a huge task. And a city like Gaza, one of the five major cities of the Philistines, actually comprising a city-state in and of itself, its gates probably would have had bronze or iron sheathing on the outside of the gate, adding to its weight. So you have to add that in. Then you've got the sockets. Those are heavy. Then you've got the bar of the gate, and that's heavy you're going to end up with well over 15,000 pounds to have to move for one man to just pick up and he ripped it off of its moorings. I mean, you know, it, it, it wasn't that it was falling down and it just happened to fall on him and he stood up and carried it off. He ripped it off. That's added power. In fact, in this paper, we even did some uh, examples of what the foot pounds of energy were necessary. For Samson to lift 5,350 pounds to a height of three feet would require 16,050 foot pounds of work. And he, listed, he lifted at least twice that. And then you figure out how far he carried it. I mean, the amount of foot pounds of work performed here is absolutely astonishing. I mean, try to get my Ford pickup to do that much work. I mean, that, that's power. That's power. Uh, Stan Swinney and I, the, the NASA scientists, also began work on another project to look at the walls of Jericho. And I got hold of the excavation reports of Kathleen Kenyon and John Garstang and began to go through looking at the walls of Jericho and what they were like. Very disappointed by Kathleen Kenyon's work because Kathleen Kenyon actually only excavated an area about oh, 25 feet by 30 feet wide uh, in one part of the city of Jericho. She didn't do nearly as much work as John Garstang had done before her. But in spite of that, she did do some work on one of the walls. And what we discovered from the archaeological reports, it's the walls at ancient Jericho, Old Testament Jericho, the time of Joshua, were built as a casemate style of wall. In other words, the wall was divided into sections and they were hollow inside and then sheathed outside and the inside was filled with dirt in order to give it strength rather than having it solid stone. But it was so built in such a way that when the re frequent earthquakes hit the area of Jericho that if the earthquake epicenter was nearby and it was a real timbler, the wall of Jericho wouldn't collapse like a row of dominoes because the casemate construction was specially constructed to allow pieces of wall to break away and not pull down the rest of the wall with it. Therefore, if you're going to have the wall at Jericho collapse and fall outward the way Joshua chapter 6 describes it, no earthquake, in fact, Stan began doing the work on using the Richter scale on earthquakes, the amount of damage, and also doing the amount of force or power that would have to be exerted in order to collapse the walls of Jericho. Uh, before he uh, got that completed, the Lord led us away. I ended up in Bangladesh. Uh, when we got back to the States and I looked up Stan again, uh, we began talking about picking up the work where he left off to finish a series of articles like this on this type of, of uh, information. And the Lord took him home just about a year afterwards. And uh, so we never got to finish it. But you look at those things that makes it very obvious. If you look at it objectively, if you take the record and look at it archaeologically, historically, geologically, every other wise, and talk about it plainly, it's very obvious this is a miracle. There is no natural explanation for it. It's impossible to have a natural explanation. And yet that's what a lot of people are trying to do even with the walls of Jericho. They're trying to say that, well, it's just an accident of timing. 
Uh, the Israel marched around the city seven times and there happened to be an earthquake at the same time and the wall collapsed and fell down. Well, wait a minute. Where's your evidence? Number one, where's the evidence or a record that there was an earthquake? Number two, what about the evidence archaeologically of the casemate structure of the walls at that time? How could it collapse in this fashion? How strong of an earthquake would it take to collapse all the wall? And to collapse it outwardly. What are the physics involved? You see, when you start putting those things together, gentlemen, you're left with only one answer. It's a work of God. It is not due to some natural phenomenon. And I'm, I'm afraid that we too often, even as evangelicals, have begun to try to explain everything away on the basis of things that are natural, whether it's the ten plagues of Egypt or the collapse of the wall of Jericho or Samson carrying off the uh, uh, gates of Gaza. And that's a very unfortunate thing because in doing that we have demeaned God and we've ignored the text. We're basically doing the same as the historical critics. We're asking a question, what's the text say? And then our follow-up question is, what really happened? And that implies a hermeneutics of doubt and skepticism. So be careful of that. This is one of the reasons why we're spending time on talking about using and being familiar with extra biblical materials and evidence for your text. Be familiar with it. Now I wanted to talk about the two chapters you were assigned to read for today in Cracking Old Testament Codes. You are assigned to read the chapter on uh, narrative by Walt Kaiser starting on page 69 and the chapter on history by Jean Merrill. As you were reading through these chapters, what are some of the, the things you noted? First of all, let's begin with what's the difference between narrative and history? What's the distinction? Yes. History focuses on individuals. History focuses on the nation. Absolutely. Normal narrative focuses on individual individual exploits and escapades. For example, the individual Joseph, the Joseph story. That's not a history. It is a narrative, just plain simple narrative, because it focuses on an individual. But a history focuses on nations, on larger groups or people groups. Uh, so when you get into something like the book of Exodus you get, or the book of Numbers, you get into a history type of format there as opposed to just a simple narrative because you're dealing with the entire people of Israel. And the individuals are incidental to it and there's a large number of different individuals that play key roles. When you get into the books of Kings and Chronicles, uh, when you get into Judges, there's no single individual in the book of Judges that is being focused on. You have all the Judges from time to time, but it's a history about the people of Israel and how every man did that which is right in his own eyes. And uh, what happened to them going through these cycles of disobedience, chastisement, repentance, and then deliverance, and then going through them again and again and again and again. So that's the difference between history and narrative. What are some of the elements that Kaiser said you need to watch out for, look for in narrative? Plot. Plot. Okay. Scenes. 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 Settings. Point of view. Point of view. Is that from the point of view of God or the point of view of an individual, a point of view of a people? How, how's the narrative being written? All right. So we, we do the same things you do with a play or a drama, right? You, you find out, okay, where are the scene changes? Who are the people involved? You look at the personnel. Who are the actors, so to speak? Uh, who are they, the characters? How, why are the various characters chosen? And what's the reason for this being put together? Uh, the plot tells you the progress of the story, but What's the purpose? What's the aim? What was the intent of the author? For example, in reading the book of Ruth, what was the intent of writing the story of Ruth? Is it just a story about a Moabite woman who was a widow and she finds another husband? Is that all it's about? It's more than that, isn't it, Chris? Chapter 4, we have a genealogy that helps us understand. 
This is about the great great grandmother of David, King David, and so we have her story given there, and and it shows the the continued line there, leading up to David, uh, coming from Judah forward. You know, it's it's that tie-in to the entire plot or history of the entire Old Testament. To show from Genesis 49:10, where you have Judah, out of whom the king will come. And then you have a king, and that king is David, and you just, you keep building till you have an entire storyline covering the entire Old Testament. So we have to look at the intent as well. Now, what do we look for in a history? Uh, what did Gene Merrill say about that? What, what are the things we try to watch for and look for in a history? You want to identify the people are involved, right? If it's a particular group, which group? Is it the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Israel? Is it uh, Assyria? Is it the, the, the Syrians or Arameans of Damascus? Who are they? We want to look and see who the people are. What else? The four series of events that cause and effect. Okay, look at the series of events, cause and effects that develop this history and show why certain things happen to them along the way and what their ultimate condition is. Uh, some of these histories have a undercurrent, a byline there of either blessing or curse. Judgment or blessing. And so we want to watch for that as well. We want to look to see, okay, who's writing it? Uh, from whose viewpoint? Is this a God's viewpoint of the history? Or is it Israel's viewpoint of the history? Or a particular individual's? viewpoint of the history. Uh, as you're going through these two, a couple of things I wanted to point out for you. Uh, there are four points of view, Kaiser mentions on page 73. The spatial, the temporal, the psychological, and the ideological. The point of view can be a person, but what is that person's viewpoint involving? Is it just spatial? Is it just the idea of saying, okay, it's a certain place in time, a certain country, a certain setting and area that is uh, in mind here, perhaps to explain how this country came to be uh, or how that individual settled in that area? Uh, temporal, is it, is, what time period is it? Is it a period of exile? Is it a period of uh, famine or drought? I mean, when we look at uh, the story of Joseph, the spatial view is not the main focus because it changes location too often. And you look at the temporal and it's his entire life is being covered. So it's not necessarily the temporal. The psychological, well, there's a lot about the psychological, about this young man that could be terribly damaged by what he's gone through, but he seems to excel in everything he does because he trusts God. And he stands for him. Well, it's more ideological, isn't it? And the ideology comes out at the end of the story when you have Joseph himself summarize it by saying that God intended all these things for good. And that's, that becomes the focal point, that as we look at the life of, of uh, Joseph, the viewpoint is God's declaration of his being sovereignly in control of a man's situation so that even when things appear to be bad, he intends it and uses it to bring about good on even a larger scale. Not just for Joseph personally, not just for even Egypt, but for... Israel especially. He becomes their protector. He becomes their preserver. And he becomes the implementer of that prophecy given to Abraham in chapter 15 that his descendants would go into Egypt and remain there for 400 years. So we have a lot involved in that. We want to be certain that we then bring that out of the narrative as we go through. Um, When he walked through the example of Jacob wrestling with God. Did you catch what he was talking about on the pun or the play on words for Jabbok and Jacob? Kind of clever, huh? Literary devices. Remember I mentioned to you the use of the word bore for pit. How Joseph went from pit to pit. From one pit where his brothers put him to the pit where uh, Potiphar put him. 
Uh, you have different literary devices used in narrative. It's not that it is something just plain and simple. A narrative means you don't have any literary devices like you have in poetry because you can have things in there. Uh, he even points out here a supposed acrostic in the book of Ruth. And there are some who even show a chiasm in the story of the book of Ruth in the way it's organized and the way the characters are laid out. Um, dialogue and structure. Narrative, remember the key part of narrative in the uh, element of grammar is Waik Tol verbs. That's the framework. But the Waik Tol verb uh, framework is interrupted by dialogue. And individual dialogues, conversations, are placed within it that help to advance the story and to fill out the story. When you're looking at the dialogues, we have to be very careful not to treat the verbs inside the dialogue the same as or contiguous with the verbs outside it in the framework. Uh, the dialogue is very important to observe and understand why the writer, remember in most of these cases, there's very little dialogue from what actually took place. I mean, if you take a look even the Joseph story, uh, obviously we're not given every conversation that took place nor the totality of any one conversation perhaps. It's selected, it's chosen, it's limited in order to give us a certain picture and uh, get a, give us certain information that's significant and important. It isn't the totality of what went on. How do we approach narrative and history with regard to application. Let's talk about exposition. How do we approach it for application? If you're going to preach on the book of Ruth, for example, what's going to be your expository point? What's going to be your propositional statement or potential statement for preaching the book of Ruth? Any ideas? You know, it can be preached in one sermon. Rick Holland preached it in one sermon. The entire book told the whole story of Ruth. Did a fantastic job, too. Well, there's those who take it and look at Ruth 1.16 and pick their propositional statement from that because she said that your God will be my God and I will dwell where you dwell, I'll go where you go. And so there's faithfulness. The word chesed is used in the book to show steadfast, loyal love, family loyalty and love. And so some make a propositional statement uh, to, the, to the effect that as Ruth demonstrated steadfast loyalty to Naomi, we are to show steadfast loyalty to God. Now, what do you think about that type of equation, that type of application? Okay, we only have, do we have any statement there about loyalty to God anywhere in the book? We have God's loyalty to man mentioned, but not man's loyalty to God. What about this propositional statement? That as Ruth showed loyalty to her mother-in-law, we as believers ought to be loyal and caring for our families. Okay, so what is the book intended to teach and how do we apply that? <coughs> Jason? Any ideas? I haven't studied the book of Ruth in depth. Okay. And since you're reading it right now, I hesitate to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> is that the book of Ruth is in a large way intended to show because it's the genealogy of David that God uses the weak and small and sometimes foolish things to shame the wise. Okay. Yes, Carl? Uh, what about redemption? Okay. We have a kinsman redeemer referred to. But do we make that into a propositional statement that says uh, we are redeemed by God? Andrew? I think it has, to, it has to be linked into what Jason was talking about, the genealogy at the end that finds the point of what comes before. Okay. And you have an unfaithful family, you have a, a, a Moabitess who, who which the law um, had hit ban from being part of Israel, and yet that was part of the means that God used to then bring through 
uh, bring forth the edit from. And so you have the, the something of, of the character or of God in the sovereign way he works and uses it. He brings Gentile nations into his plans. Okay, good. Now, how do we put that into propositional statements? You got an idea, Tim? I wasn't thinking quite along those lines, so um, I might not better comment so well on that. Okay, try. What do you um, do? Then we'll go to Chris. Well, the, the thought process I was going through, and, um, and it probably is not as good as the one Andrew was talking about, uh, was the, uh, the restoration of Naomi. All right. right. Um, because Naomi, she, she turns around from um, being uh, somewhat sad and, and separated to um, being restored to joy and uh, having a future ahead of her. Uh, I hadn't really thought that through, it's just oh, something right. that just came to mind. Okay, Chris? Kind of going into the Gentile theme is many God's redemption expanding or extending to, to the to Gentiles, to the Gentile nations. Okay, but is the story of Ruth really about God's redemption? I mean, we do have Redeemer there, but remember that's kinsman Redeemer having to do with Naomi, having to do with Ruth, having to do with Elimelech. And it's not a spiritual thing. It's right out of Deuteronomy chapter 25 and elsewhere where we have this uh, uh, laviorate marriage to take care of a family so that they don't lose their uh, inheritance. Okay, yes. Isaac? Is there not a sense in which the book of Ruth is about a sovereign God who provides for his people and he does that by providing for Naomi even though she does not have faith in God and in the same way provides for his people as a whole by providing a redeemer for them. All so right. that God is sovereign provider and we okay. see that happening in two levels. Alright, good. Now, notice that if we come back to a theocentric viewpoint, a God-centered viewpoint, we get closer to what we're talking about in this book. And it really has to do with the viewpoint as well. The viewpoint here is a story by which God is demonstrating that he is in control of all that's happened. He's in control of a famine that drives the family from the land of Judah to begin with and into Moab. He's still in control even though the sons marry Moabite women. He's still in control even though the husband and the two sons die and leave their wives widows. He's still in control when the widows decide to come back to Judah or police to go back to her home and so only Ruth and Naomi return and Naomi has some bitterness in her because of all she's experienced and she is about to lose the land of Elimelech, her husband. So what's going to happen? How this, how's this going to all work out? Well, God has it all resolved because there is a kinsman redeemer. In fact, there are two kinsman redeemers. But one is not qualified and he's disqualified so now what's going to be done? Well God has one and not only does the kinsman redeemer there to redeem the land of Naomi, he's there to redeem Ruth and marry her and raise up seed for her husband, the son of Elimelech to pro provide and make certain everything goes on in the family and then we close the book with this idea that this is all part of a process that leads to King David and that same type of picture we're reminded of when we go to the Gospels and we see there the genealogy of Jesus and we have the names of some of the Gentile women in the line of Jesus as well. Showing that God's control and sovereignty over his people was not just to have control over a, sing a single family in Bethlehem and Ephrata but also over the tribe of Judah and also over the people of Israel and also over the entire plan that eventually would provide salvation to even the Gentiles through this one who would be from that line. So it's the sovereign God in control of history is prim the primary point that's being brought out. God's in control. The better propositional statement to use the analogy and principalize it and bring a principle across to our lives is no matter what happens to us, God is in control of our circumstances and even when we're suffering, he can be in control of that to use it for good. It's almost the same story we hear about Joseph, is it not? God makes a covenant with his people. 
he fulfills and completes that covenant regardless of the immediate circumstances that the individual members of the covenant community might experience or what they might go through. And the same is true of us today. God is at work to fulfill his will and his program in history and what we go through and suffer is just a small part of that tapestry he weaves in accomplishing his will uh, in history and even in the church today. Now we're not Israel. We aren't related to the covenants they're talked about here of Abraham and David. We're in the new covenant. And yet the truth is basically the same. All things work together for good to those who are the called, you see, Romans chapter 8 comes right back to the same truth. And that's what we need to learn from it. Now there are some incidental evidences or things can be used along the way to say, okay, God's covenant people had to live godly lives. What did it mean to be godly? Well, one is that you took care of your family. You fulfilled family obligations. That's true not only in the Old Testament, it's true in the New Testament. James says that true godliness is what? To keep oneself unspotted, pure from the world and to visit the widow and the orphan in the time of their affliction. The care of the widows, Naomi and uh, Ruth, are significant aspect of the godliness that God expected of his people in the Old Testament. It's still an aspect of godliness he expects of his people today in the, even in the church. And it's not because we're Israel. It's because of the character of God, who he is, and that we are to reflect that character as his children. So there are similarities you can tie to, but you can't make that the focal point of the book and say this is the purpose of the book. The purpose of the book is a grander scheme, and that's one of the things that, that Walt Kaiser and Jean Merrill also point out in both the area of narrative and history is very often we're looking at things that are a larger scale than the individual things. And remember this, when it comes to narrative, uh, it is description, not prescription. By that I mean that it's, it's a description of what happened in history to God's people. It is not a prescription of how we too must live. In other words, there's not a law there coming out of it or a command coming out of it that says, because of this, you must do this. If anything, it's because of who God is, we must be godly. <laughs> and that's very generic. And you just see the, the consistent principles applied there. But uh, I've often said that for the book of Ruth, uh, if, if it's going to be preached as something that has to do with family, probably the best time to preach is Mother's Day. And to tell people, you know, you, you've, uh, your mother-in-law is someone you ought to love as much as anyone. And look what, how Ruth, as a godly individual, loved her mother-in-law. You know, and I don't know how many people would want to sit there for a, a sermon on Mother's Day about loving your mother-in-law. It's a good thing. I've got a great mother-in-law. I praise the Lord for her every day. She's fantastic. And, uh, it's, it, but that's really not the purpose of the book. It wasn't given to teach us how to love our mother-in-law. It's, it's David there is the main purpose and it's the program of God. So there's a sense here, gentlemen, in which on the book of Ruth, it's be careful of seeing Christ in every text. Okay? Do exegesis, not eis, not isa Jesus. Don't insert Jesus into every text. <laughs> but the big picture of the book of Ruth really has to do with the messianic program of God. And so there's a sense in which it contributes to that. And shows how that God had already identified the Messiah's coming through the woman. Genesis 3.15 identifies the Messiah coming through the line of Judah, the tribe of Judah in Genesis chapter 49 and as it goes down through is eventually going to identify him as going through the line of David and this is before the time of David and God is in control of making certain that that line is kept intact even with a Gentile wife 
to Boaz, that line is kept intact so that it happens just as God had designed. And that was no accident that he allowed Gentile women into the line because that is part of his plan as we see when we get to the Gospels and look at the genealogy there. So sometimes we just have to back off and take a look at the big picture. And the stories of the Old Testament are given to us according to Paul, remember, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He said, these things were written as examples for us. And then he specifies certain things that are examples. We are not to murmur as Israel murmured in the wilderness. We're not to worship idols as they worshiped idols, etc. Uh, in Romans 15, he says, these things are written that you might have hope. Because if we see that God is consistent in all the events that he does, all his works throughout history, then that offers us hope that what he's told us he will do, he will also do. So when, he sa when Jesus says he's coming again, we can count on that. He's coming again. When we observe the Lord's table and we say until he comes, then we, we know that's going to occur. There's hope there. So there are different things we get from looking at the Old Testament. And uh, we have to be very careful how we look at it and what we draw from it. And that's a, uh, one of the tough areas. I love listening to Walt Kaiser. When he uh, uh, addressed ETS some years ago on the book that he wrote, that is our second textbook on preaching and teaching from the Old Testament, he did the section on narrative because that's his, his joy. That's why he has the narrative chapter in here. And... It was quintessential Walt Kaiser, through and through. The room was filled. There wasn't even room on the floor. I mean, people were sitting all around his feet. Uh, they were standing outside the doors so deep that you couldn't get in the door or get out if you had to. And uh, they were listening to him, and he just stood up there and began to expound on a narrative in the Old Testament and to make it live. And in the midst of that, he said... Now, this occurred, but don't make that the point of your message because it's only incidental to the story. The big story here is seen only when you back off and take a look at what God is doing. We get too involved in what man is doing. What is Joseph doing? What is Potiphar doing? What is Ruth doing? What is Boaz doing? What is Naomi doing? And he said, what we need to ask is what is God doing in this situation? The God question. So back up and take a good look at that when you go through the book of Ruth. Make certain you've got a handle on that. And then remember, the other details are just dis description. Yes, they're the description of how godly people lived in that time. And there will be similarities the way we ought to live. But it's not prescribed by what we read there. It's prescribed by the God we serve. That we reflect him as they were to reflect him. Yes, Aldo? What do you think would be the, the differences in, uh, I guess, understanding narrative in the Old Testament, which is basically God working through, you know, different means, and he's, <coughs> the big picture is his redemptive purposes through events and things like that, as opposed to, like, the narrative in the gospel, which is like God himself, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the events, and like how to interpret them, like, the narrative in the, in the New well, in the Gospels, you have many of the same elements. I mean, first of all, you have a narrative. It's centered around an individual. But this individual is very unique. It is Christ himself, the God-man. And so that makes it very, very different than anything we read in the Old Testament because nowhere there do we have the story of a God-man. So the Gospel is unique in that. A parallel to the narratives would be the book of Acts where you have a history of the early church and you have individuals that are talked about uh, and you really you're getting to a history because there are individuals but the flow is really what happens to the church through that period of time. And it's kind of chopped up there to where you have different individuals involved, Peter and you have Stephen and you have Philip and you have Paul and Barnabas and, and others. Uh, but as you're looking at that, the, what the church did in those days, for example, they appointed deacons and they, uh, they had a church meeting, a church business meeting. 
uh, in Acts 15 uh, to determine uh, what they would do about Gentiles who were converting and coming to Christ. Uh, do we look at that as a prescribed method for the church to operate today? Uh, well, first of all, if it's prescribed that we operate that way, how are we, where are we going to get the apostles? Because the church at Jerusalem, we're told there was the apostles, there were the apostles, there were the elders of the church, and we have what the elders do, but today we don't have apostles to go with the elders. Now, it does show us what the job of an elder is, basically, to lead. But we have to make a distinction there between who are apostles and who are elders. The early church given there is so different from what we have today. If we try to prescribe to do things exactly the same way, we might not get them done ad adequately or rightly. It describes and gives one way it was done. Uh, one of the things I enjoyed doing when I was a missionary in Bangladesh was going through the uh, New Testament and looking at how Paul did missions in different locations. How did he do missions in Antioch? How did he do missions in Cyprus? How did he do missions at Ephesus? How did he do missions at Corinth? How did he do missions at Berea or at Philippi uh, and at Rome? And you find out that Paul's missionary methodology was different in every place. It was never the same. So he did not follow a specified methodology that we can then trap and say, okay, this is how we do, do missions today. He gave us examples of different ways to do missions in different settings and different locations at different times. And we, for example, uh, take a look at what he did at Philippi. Uh, how many of you are going to go out and start a church and you're going to go find uh, some prayer place where some women are meeting and you're going to start your church with women? I don't see any takers. And you know, I know a church in uh, Louisiana, in Baton Rouge, that uh, basically uh, was a church that uh, several very strong-willed and godly women were the driving force in getting that church started. And they cannot get a master seminary grad to go there to pastor the church. Why? They want to know where the male leadership is. And they don't have any. But Paul worked with that in Philippi and planted a church. And eventually when he wrote back, they had elders and deacons. He worked with what was available and what God gave him at the time. He was willing to start with women if that's the way it was going to start. And eventually God kept giving him new. Think of the Philippian jailer. He got the Philippian jailer, but look how he got him. He had to do some suffering. He had to be put in jail. All right? And God performed a miracle to release him in the middle of the night. Uh, don't expect God to do all those things for you in your setting. It's not prescriptive. It's descriptive of how God worked at that time in a special way. So there's some parallels between Acts and the Old Testament that way. And... Um, the Gospels are very, very different. Uh, I would still think in the Gospels, I, I, I love the uh, work that's been done. Um, a peasant, uh, looking at the Gospel, oh, what is it? Something through peasant eyes. Maybe it's just through peasant eyes. By a fellow named Bailey, B-A-I-L-E-Y. Uh, he takes the culture and setting and uh, history of the first century A.D., and helps to explain some of the parables of Christ and the teachings of Christ on, the, on those bases. He has some very good stuff, some uh, good things to look at. So you still have to use, since it's narrative, you still have to use the culture and setting and background. You have to use the plot. You have to use characters. You have to look at the scenes, and you have to look at the point of view, the same as you would in Old Testament narrative as you're interpreting the Gospels. If you go through your syllabus, I just want to point out a couple things. If you look at your syllabus under exegeting Hebrew narrative on page 40 and following in the study notes, and uh, walk through the elements of Hebrew narrative, scene, plot, point of view, characterization, setting, dialogue, 
keyword structure, rhetorical devices, and then I've given you some guidelines, and then I've walked you through an example in Judges chapter 16, verses 1 to 3, and walked through each piece of that, given you a diagram on page 46, uh, the research of geographical, historical, and cultural aspects of the setting on page 47. As you go down through there, I've given you material here. John Walton, Victor Matthews, and Mark Chevalis, the IVP Bible background commentary. Uh, that is different than the other one that uh, Walton did that is pictorial. It's the Zondervan one. This is the IVP one. This one's one volume for the Old Testament. Uh, it covers primarily just historical materials. Uh, I've given you King and Steger, Life and Biblical Israel, Unger's New Bible Handbook, Barry Beitzel's Moody Atlas, uh, Aharoni and Aviona's The Macmillan Bible Atlas, George Adam Smith, The Historical Geography of the Holy Land, Ed Heinsohn on the Philistines. Uh, that is an excellent place for you to go to get a good example of how to integrate background studies into the biblical text. This was Ed's uh, THM thesis at Grace Theological Seminary years ago. And he's d he did an excellent job. It was later published by Baker. And it, he studies the Philistines in the Bible, in the Old Testament. Who are they? What does the Old Testament say about them? And then he begins to apply that to help us better understand the narratives and the histories in the Old Testament. Uh, uh, one individual study, very well worth having if you can get hold of it, find it somewhere. It was published in 1971, so today you have to get it probably a used copy. I don't think uh, Baker has reprint a lot of those. Uh, Dennis Bailey's Geography of the Bible, Trudy Dothan's work on the Philistines, their material culture, and then the latest is uh, Zondervan Illustrated Bible Backgrounds Commentary, John Walton. These are all the types of materials you would use in the book of Judges to try to get that background material. Now, for those of you in Psalm 33, go to those same works and go to the Psalms. For those of you in Job, go to the same works and go to Job. For those of you in uh, uh, working in uh, Isaiah, go to Isaiah and look there. You'll find a wealth of material just in some of those sources. Just in that IVP background one and in the uh, Zondervan Illustrated Bible backgrounds. You'll get a lot of good information. And then check some of the scripture indexes in Dennis Bailey and in Philip King and Lawrence Steger. And you might find material that would be of great use to you. For example, those of you in Isaiah 1, uh, some of you have been translating and tempted to translate it as scarlet material or scarlet garments. Where did that scarlet color come from? How were the garments uh, made? Uh, what's involved in that? You see, that's a cultural element. That's a cultural element right there. How do you, what, what color is it? How do we know what color it is? Is it purple or is it red? Uh, how often did Israelites wear such garments? Or did they wear all white? Remember the restrictions on them by law? So how do they understand? But remember the virtuous woman, Proverbs 31? All of her household was clothed in what? Scarlet. So think about those things and tie them in. What's the picture the Israelite is getting in their mind when they hear Isaiah 118? That helps you to better interpret it as well. If you can understand the analogy, the comparison that's being made. Uh, then I went into the area of... Uh, exegeting Hebrew histories gave you a definition about the histories and the accuracy and reliability. The elements are a historian or author, a reader, a recipient, to whom is it written, the point of view, a plot, the characters, the setting, key words again, key words, structure and rhetorical devices, and then you have resources here uh, being referred to, and, and there's a number of things I've walked you through. I've tried to help you to get a broad background of all these different genres and literary types so that when you're doing your own papers, you have an idea of a pattern. If you'll notice, all these are in a particular pattern. Every one of these. There are certain elements that are different for each genre, but the organization I've used to go through in the treatment of each of those is almost identical. 
the methodology by which you do your exegesis and you progress down through the uh, internal and external uh, contexts to then come to your exposition. So read through those and check them. Those of you in Psalms, read the Psalms one. Those of you in Job, read the wisdom one. Those of you in Isaiah, read the prophecy one and get some clues and some ideas about the ways you might be thinking about handling your text.